Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here in studio at the OG Command Center with my colleague and uh, friend, the uh, intrepid Mr. Scott Bernstein. Hey now. And we've got Benny, the producer and engineer extraordinaire in the house as well. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Just want to remind everyone before we get started to please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's growing. We're pretty excited about that. Please uh, share it. Leave comments. Uh, we're also active on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, I enjoy interacting with people on these uh, through social media, and we appreciate your support. It's, it's, a, it's a big help in terms of spreading the word, so, so please keep that in mind. Um, we have a pretty exciting show today, a popular topic. Uh, we can tell from the analytics that whenever we do an episode about outlaw bikers that uh, it's very popular. And this is a very timely, very hot topic going on here. Uh, we're going to talk about the Hells Angels, and um, we're also going to talk about the Hells Angels and their feud with the pagans. So we're going to deep dive this. Uh, you want to get us started, yeah. Scott? Just to- Well, uh, there are you know kind of two pieces of this. Um, and, and it's, and it spans the nation you know, goes yes. from one side of the country coast to, coast. to the other. Uh, so in the last couple of weeks, uh, first there was a, uh, search warrant that had been sealed on uh, affidavits that were tied into that search warrant, um, in some court filings out in, um, on the, uh, in new England that, uh, were unsealed in the last couple of weeks that, have revealed that uh, the Hells Angels have a quote unquote green light order on the pagans. And it's a fallout from the pagans blue wave expansion campaign that we've talked about on this pod that was launched about five years ago and has, has had quite a few ripple effects. Um, and, and it's, I think it's been successful there. Uh, they're expanding rapidly uh, ac- across the country, and uh, it's the brainchild of of the the kind of Svengali godfather of of the pagans right now, uh, Conan the Barbarian, Keith Richter, who will be coming out of prison in the next couple of weeks, or probably the next couple of months. Um, but so there there was some conflict that was stem from the blue wave where the pagans were moving into new England and were going into territory that the hell's angels, uh, had previously claimed. Uh, there were some dust ups last year, uh, no murders, but, uh, some, uh, very, very violent clashes, uh, where people got stabbed and shot. And, uh, from that unrest, there was a search warrant of a pagan's clubhouse in fall river massachusetts which is kind of the the middle point between boston and providence it's a real you know it's a factory town very working class very multi-ethnic and uh from that search warrant we found out that there was a hell's angels there was a meeting of of bosses on the west coast in uh, some point in late 2021 so this is not that long ago and there was a confidential informant in the meeting. And as the meeting came to an end, the confidential informant stole what's being described as a minutes sheet where they, they took notes on what was being discussed at the uh, meeting. And in those notes, it said that uh, there was a vote and that because of what was going on uh, with the pagans moving into Hell's Angels territory, not just in New England, but around the country, that the the bosses in the Hell's Angels put out a green light order, which is a is a is a shoot on sight order, uh, and and an order to engage violently any pagan that they see. Um, so that's one part of it, and then just a couple of days ago, there were uh, guilty verdicts and a very big hell's angels racketeering and murder case out in San Francisco that had some ties to new England and the hell's angels Boston boss, uh, Chris Ranieri, who they call the rain man. Um, people that I've talked to said that the impetus for the pagans pushing into Massachusetts was 
Rain Man's inclusion in this big 2017 uh, murder and, and racketeering in Daymata, California, pulling him off the street and getting him uh, put behind bars. And that was part of the uh, reasoning or, or part of the first, a, a portion of the first part of the blue wave was to go into uh, New England, knowing that the Hells Angels boss there had been taken off the streets. So I just want to ask you something. You said they raided the Pagan's Clubhouse, but that doesn't make sense to get minutes from a Hells Angels. No, no, no. The search warrant to raid the Pagan's house. Yes, right. Was, was based on. Was based on, or okay. not based, mentioned in that search warrant. Yeah. Was the fact that a confidential informant had stole a minute sheet. Um, from a meeting in, in California months earlier. And that was part of the search warrant that gave the feds the right to go into the pagans clubhouse. And I believe they also used um, that information to raid hell's angels clubhouse in, um, in, in a part of Massachusetts as well. Yeah. So I know it's confusing. No. Yeah. So let, let's, let's break it down. So as you point out, there's this blue wave mandate. And my understanding was New England traditionally was Hell's Angels territory. Yeah. And the outlaws uh, came in there uh, in the 80s, uh, pretty heavy. But uh, yeah. And so according to these documents, um, Salem is like the sort of the nexus Boston, of Hell's it's like, Angels. It's like uh, Boston, it's, it's, I think the chapter is called the Boston Salem chapter. Okay. Salem's, but Sa near, but Salem's is, like 45 minutes is it, out okay, of Boston. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I've, Maybe I'm not really familiar yeah, it's not, with that it's area. Not, I mean, I've been to Boston, but yeah. not the larger area. Um, so it seems like for a while, uh, the Hells Angels were, um, I don't know if you want to say dormant, but they, there wasn't a lot of activity well, there. In that particular, um, I don't know about Hells Angels' presence in Boston proper, so I don't want to speak yeah. out of turn. The, the unrest or the the tensions that have boiled over according to, to this reporting um, in the daily beast shout out to, to them for, for yeah. uh, first reporting this, this uh, what this information we've gleaned off of the search warrant that was unsealed a couple of weeks ago um, that, you know, the, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. Here. Well, just I was saying that the it seems like the Hell's Angels had neglected right okay this, this, this kind of yeah. area near so, right Rhode so, Island. So this area is is considered the, the southeast coast of Massachusetts. Um, it's not Boston, right? You're probably an hour and a half out of Boston. Yeah. So it's it's Cape Cod, it's um, other cities in in, in south in southeast Massachusetts, and and the two major players here territorially uh, were Cape Cod and Fall River and the Pagans had no presence at all in Massachusetts. Hell's Angels, again, I'm not positive about Boston other than the fact that we know that R R Ranieri, the Rain yeah. Man, was leading that Salem-Boston chapter. But I'm, I'm not exactly sure if they have a clubhouse in Salem or if they have a clubhouse in Boston. But what, as you mentioned, the the Fall River Hell's Angels had kind of gone dormant, right? Which uh, emboldened or uh, inspired, I guess, the pagans to not go to Boston or Salem, where Rainieri and and that that Hell's Angels camp was. They went to a place that had been abandoned by the Hell's by the Hell's Angels in, in Fall River, planted their flag there, and then in response, that previously dormant. Hell's Angels Southeast Massachusetts group regrouped right. and opened uh, chapters on Cape Cod. And, right, right. And so they reestablished their um, their uh, presence, which, uh, you know, I, I imagine the pagans uh, found provocative. And, um, and then we know from the court documents here that uh, this was not going, they were not going to coexist peacefully that yeah. the, the hell's angels also gave the order um the green light order to to go attack right the falls, we're gonna the, drive them the, out of the, here well and they went and they staged um a group attack on the fall river clubhouse 
uh, the Pagan's Fall River Clubhouse, where uh, over a dozen, if not two dozen, Hell's Angels showed up in like vans and unloaded uh, a lot of artillery <laughs> and came out with, with knives and bats and hammers and uh, attacked the, 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 fall, the Fall River Pagan's headquarters. And there was a hour long brawl in the middle of the street. Uh, one of the Pagan's, I guess, was left like impaled. He survived, but then there was blood all over the. Yeah, they said it was pretty. pretty yeah, bloody. pretty pretty gruesome and pretty public. It's it's interesting to this reporting because it's it's actually even even more dramatic than that. According to the reporting, and which is based on this court documents, more than a hundred Hell's okay. Angels. So I'm I'm mistaken. <laughs> so it's even more dramatic. I said a dozen or two dozen. Yeah, okay, <laughs> right. five dozen. It's, it's even more dramatic. Yeah, that a hundred uh, gathered at a rest stop in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. And that along with support clubs like the Sidewinders were there too. So it's just really extraordinary. Like a hundred dudes. I mean, that's no joke. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and this was last year. Yeah. This wasn't right. like, right. this was in 2022. Right. Not like in the seventies or something. Yeah. So it's interesting that also according to the documents that they, they took pictures for social media yeah. in route. And I wonder what you think about that because we were just having an off camera discussion about um certain wise guys that have a presence on social media and that doesn't go over well with the ogs and i wonder what with with the biker world maybe someone could comment and, and share with us but um you know what my first <laughs> how, how they my, feel my about first that. impulse in terms of where, where my brain goes here is the, that there is probably a difference in motivation or to, at some levels of motivation where I'm guessing that when members of the Hells Angels are posting on, on their socials as they prepare to go take, uh, take the fight, if you will, to a rival group, I think that's probably a promotional tool. Mm, flexing. Right, and, and a recruiting tool. Yeah. As opposed to some of the Italian um, wise guys or the you know, African-American drug dealers who are just kind of glamming out. Yeah, yeah, good point. Like just kind yeah. of boasting and and uh, showing off. Yeah, I think with the with the bikers, it's more of like, come join this. You can That's be part of this. Yeah, it's it's more of a cultural than yeah. like an individual kind of thing. So there's something else that that was in this uh, reporting I want to ask you about. So the reason why they know this, obviously, they they monitored social media after the point, but it says cameras. I'm I'm reading from the report here. Cameras operated by the Fall River Police Department tracked the 100 strong group of bikers as they rode to Fall River and carried out the attack. Now, if, if, that, if that's true, my question is, why didn't yeah, they intervene? Why, why didn't they stop it? Why didn't they stop it? Yeah. If, they, if they knew that was about to happen. And I realize if they, if they got 100 dudes, right, you know, Logistically, two, two cops be, are right. going <laughs> to throw themselves in the middle of that tornado. But... You have they have access to other resources. They could have called in SWAT or something like that. Um, so if that's true, um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. If you if you've talked to anybody, I, I don't think that's an outlier of a situation. I mean, I, in on this podcast, we've talked about scenarios where uh, you know law enforcement will, in some cases, create. Yeah, you know, I agree. That. Well, manipulate variables to create a, a, a crime to watch and then um, use to you know, that as a, a predicate for indictment. But I think a lot of times the, there there be there's this push and pull between. Well, if we stopped it now, the bust is a lot less sexy. No, I, I agree with that. And 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 as we've talked about in the world of law enforcement, you it. It's political. You you rise. Yeah. The more high profile bus you make, the further you rise in in whatever department you're in, if, whether yeah. it's federal or state. So I think a lot of times there's like personal personal motivations to al allow the situation to play out as much as it can play out without causing a murder. I guess. Yeah. In some cases, I think there's been situations. I shouldn't say I think. I know. I mean. With with the, the whole Scarpa FBI fiasco oh, yeah. and but the, Whitey Bulger. Whitey Bulger, where you know they were being allegedly tipped off by 
FBI agents who to go kill. Right. And and while they were in the process of planning hits, were being told where surveillance units were so they would know to avoid them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and also we know from from that in some cases informants, especially in in the biker world, informants all the time try to incite all sorts of things. Uh, you know, yeah. why, why here? Let me sell you a gun. Let's sell because dope. that helped again. It's it's a self preservation factor. Yeah, they know the more bus they can they right. can feed to their handlers in the government, the more uh, a leniency, the more money. Yes, the, you know the the more. Uh, uh, prison time cuts reduction that they'll, they'll receive. Yeah, so it gets it gets, can get pretty can get pretty sketchy. But that's one thing. What is, about the uh, fact? What about the fact yeah. though that a there was an informant in this meeting of of yeah. national bosses. Yeah. B that informant had the balls to steal the notes from the meeting and give it to, I mean, that's pretty, yeah. I think that's in some ways even being lost in some of this reporting is how did we get the knowledge that there's a green light order? Yeah. It must be someone well-placed yeah. to, to have access to that kind of information and feel yeah. confident enough. They could walk away with yeah. it. Um, so the, um, it, according to this, some of the guys broke off from the group. So guys, some guys were blocking traffic. And as you point out, they swarmed the pagans clubhouse. And then a fight ensues. The bloody melee, as, as as was already established, no one was no one was killed. Um, but um, it's again it says here investigators surveilling the property watched as cars and motorcycles sped away. Again, it, it doesn't seem like the investigators were too interested in intervening and actually arresting people. <laughs> right, intervening yeah. here, which which I think is I, I don't know. It could be that could be uh, uh, problematic. So. Um, the um, uh, it says here that the informant says investigators that Hell's Angels planned the attack because the Pagans MC members had disrespected the uh, the Hell's Angels. Um, now I don't know; it's not specific enough. I don't know if there was like some specific inter uh, um, altercations, or do they just felt by opening up a clubhouse there yeah. in the first place. Just that was an, a, a sign flying of the flag, right. wearing the colors of the pagans um, in that area, whether it was, you know, of, offensive to the hell's angels or offensive to the outlaws, because there's been a, a, a lot of dust ups there. And, and on an aside, and we're monitoring the situation, you know, I, I'm getting really, really good sourcing on the fact that over the last five, six months, there's talks between the hell's angels and the outlaws were like the the biggest rivals in the history of right. the biker world are considering calling some type of truce and and joining forces to combat this blue wave, and you got like you got Richter coming out of prison in August. Uh, under normal circumstances, he would have hit a halfway house by now, um, but I, I'm guessing they're going to keep him to the last possible second. He's doing uh, two years on a. Uh, Violation of supervised release. He was caught with a weapon, uh, leaving a pagan's party. And I'm confident in saying that there's a informant in his inner circle. Yeah, how else would they know? Because right. he gets pulled over, uh, you know, shortly after leaving that. It's too convenient. And, and they and he wasn't even carrying the gun. The gun was in a like a secret compartment. And they arrested him initially, and they didn't find the gun for another like five, six, seven hours when they. They yeah. knew where to look. So it's a powder keg of, of, a, of a scenario right now. Um, it, it, again, to give context, the pagans until Richter's plan to, uh, to um, expand was, was a very big deal in places like Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, uh, parts of New Jersey, New York, but uh, Florida, but that was it. You, people didn't, you didn't know about the pagans west of the Mississippi. They didn't know about the pagans in the Midwest. They didn't know if Kentucky was another. They didn't know about the pagans um, in, in New England. And now there are literally pagan chapters that are now being opened or that have opened in Washington State, Montana, Oregon. They're going down to uh, Texas, uh, Oklahoma. Right. Um, they're making 
alliances uh, with with um, the Mongols. So it's uh, it, it's it's a very real time. And I, I don't want to necessarily compare it to what's going on in the mafia in Canada, but yeah, it's, 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 not it, it's, not the, it's not the same thing, but it's, there's a destabilization factor there and an unpredictability factor there that I think is a parallel. Yeah, I mean, it, it was interesting a few years ago or a year ago whenever we did an episode about this and the pagans' uh, expansion, and I, and I said, well, you know, it doesn't seem like anyone's like really standing up to them. Well, now that's we see that that's not <laughs> ever since that episode. Um, that, that's actually not true. It seems like, like you mentioned some other prominent clubs are starting to reorganize and, uh, and I think the recognize band, I, that this is, you know, maybe not in their best interest to just. I heard as the get out of the way as the pagans and Mongols have have fortified their alliance or or quasi alliance. I've heard that the outlaws are aligning with the banditos. Mm. For the same reason. Oh, yeah. And the outlaws don't have a presence really west of the Mississippi. And I don't think they want to have a presence west of the Mississippi other than, you know, your your enemy's enemy is your friend. Yeah. Wasn't there a shooting in Texas not long ago? Uh, Bandinos and... Uh... Probably, but that had nothing to do with the, that had the nothing outlaws. To do with this. Okay. Right. The outlaws are a, a Midwest, down south... Yeah. Uh, East Coast. Oklahoma's probably as far west as they go, right? Yes, I would guess. But there were some outlaws dudes who were who were wearing their patch around Texas. Remember that story? No, I, no. I don't want to digress. No, no, no you're remember. right, though. Yeah. The, the outlaws I've heard um, have kind of a, I don't want to say free pass, but where before it would be difficult for them to go into Texas and wear outlaws gear right, right. because of this relationship that's forming between them and the banditos they have a uh, all okay. all clear okay um so um by the way uh talking about the the pagans in, in, on the on the east coast i i've um i've heard from people I, and i know that sounds vague and, and some people there's haters out there gonna say oh, well that's bullshit but i don't know what you want me to say i'm not <laughs> i'm not going to sit here and tell you who who we talk to yeah. like that's never going to happen so you can either believe us or not but we're it's just never going to happen so um and i hope you know i think our, our uh, a lot of our fans respect and that i think but, our reputation right uh, is is pretty our batting average is pretty good I mean. yeah um but 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 i've heard that you know, the Hells Angels in New York have good relationships with Cosa Nostra, which makes the pagans nervous, apparently, from what I've heard. But then I've also come across information, you and I said we're going to look into it, that the pagans have their own Cosa Nostra right. well, uh, ties in New York. So that's kind of interesting, too. Yeah, and the pagans have always been closely tied in. Uh, Philadelphia has always been a, um, a, a home base sure. for pagans, even though they were founded in Maryland. Um, but Philadelphia has always been a real power a power base for the pagans. And um, there's a little bit of a love, hate relationship. There's been some blips um, over the years where there's been some issues between the mob and the pagans, but for the most part in Philadelphia, the pagans and the mafia are, are aligned. Yeah. Um, you know, Joey Merlino has really good relationships with the pagans. Again, I don't want to, everyone loves Joe. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't want to, <laughs> all the other, the five families. I don't want to do the digress too far, <laughs> but I, I hear there's some new, um, relationships burgeoning in the Merlino camp, uh, with the modern, you know, the, the, the pagans, current leadership in in philadelphia which is another uh what's old is new again uh, uh the gorilla uh, uh stevie mind virgine i know mm. i'm butchering his name I'll just call him the gorilla uh he was the pagan's boss in the 90s and was actually the national boss uh, fell out of favor uh was on the shelf for a little bit and then richter who was very close with the gorilla in the 90s when when uh uh, Conan the Barbarian Richter was was rising in the Long Island pagans. Um, he brings a uh, uh, gorilla back into the fold in 2017, 18, when he takes power and he makes gorilla a big part of this blue wave and puts gorilla back in power in Philadelphia. Um, there was he's an Italian guy, right? Mondor Virgin. I think he's French. Oh, is he? But maybe I'm wrong. I'd have to. I, yeah, I can't remember. I, I, I. He's got a weird last name. He's a former cop. 
Oh, wow. um, back in like the seventies, but he's a, he's like, uh, for people that, that know the biker lingo, you know, gorilla Mondragon is the taco Bowman of Philadelphia. You know, the, the face of biker, uh, the face of the biker world in Philadelphia over the last uh, 30 years, even though he was shelved for part of that, you know, is, is the gorilla. And, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I, I just, I don't know as much about the pagan. So I, I didn't know that name didn't sound familiar to me, but I'm, uh, he, he, there was a internal mini, I don't want to say it was a war, but a, a power struggle, um, in the early two thousands, late nineties within the pagans were, were gorilla. Um, yeah. How would you pronounce the last? I don't know. I think it's Monda Virgin. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. That's how it, um, where where the gorilla got into it with a guy named Tim Flood, who they called Timmy Casual, and lost the power struggle. Uh, Flood took the club over. The gorilla was like kicked out, and then Flood ends up flipping, and the uh, the power in Philly with the pagans went to somebody else, and then the gorilla makes his way back uh, into the fold underneath Richter. But again, the, the, la- the last thing I'll say about this, and then you can look forward to some reporting, I think in the next couple months, we'll, we'll, we'll try to touch on it. The more I learn about it, there's a picture that has surfaced in the last month on social media from Joey Merlino's underboss, uh, handsome Stevie Mazzoni. Oh, it's and Joey. it's in prison. Yeah. Uh, Mazzone just uh, reported this winter to go serve five years. And the first picture of him in prison that surfaced is him with someone that I'm told is a high ranking pagan mm-hmm. and that, that there's some foreshadowing. Yeah. Well, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Although it's ironic Merlino with his, uh, that family's history with the pagans back in the day. Right. Well, <laughs> complicated. Well, 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 what's, what's funny is that Merlino was really close or is really close to a lot of these pagans. What Jimmy's talking about is, Chucky Merlino, right. Joey's dad, who was erratic at times, right. big time drinker, yeah. uh, lost his stripes because he was such a drinker. Yeah. And the incident that you're referring to was, I think, one of the, if not the impetus, one of the straws that broke the camel's back is that Chucky gets into a, a pretty big time beef with the pagans in the mid 80s and they start threatening to kill each other and kill each other's families. Yeah. And, uh, and Chucky took his, got drunk one night and took his uh, BMW and, and slams it into the pagans, like outside the pagans yeah, clubhouse all where all the bikes are, <laughs> are lined up. And, and, uh, and that, that, that was kind of interesting because it started off where Molino actually was close with those guys. He Chucky, was, well, yeah, Chucky and Nikki yeah, were right. for, through the drug connection. Right, they were kind of the liaison with, with, with Raymond, with and, Long John Martirano. Right. They were moving a bunch of drugs together. So he 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 started off getting along with the pagans, but then things went sour. Um, I think that had to do with, with a power shift where a new guy had taken over from the pagans, who wasn't the same guy that had been. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I again, I could be wrong. I know there was a guy named the Egyptian, and I'm not sure if the Egyptian was the guy that left or the guy that came that right some of the issues came with but uh it part of the blue wave is the pagans fortifying their connections and their network with groups like the mongols groups like italian la cosa nostra yeah and uh hispanic street kings the latin kings the outlaws have responded by fortifying their alliances with LCN. And I've heard making some strange bedfellows where they're aligning with some black street gangs mm. to try to combat what the pagans are doing. Um, but let's, let's segue to yeah, that. Yeah. What, one of the, it's interesting because we're talking about outlaw bikers on the East coast. And one of these prominent guys from the, from the new England hell's angels is also linked to a big bust out west, yeah. Which is something you you previewed at the beginning, and I I just want to add something. Um, if for people who who watch our program or listen to the podcast and they're not from out west, um, you may not realize like the Hell's Angels are reported on all the time. Yeah. If you're out in California, I lived in Arizona for a while. 
um, Nevada. It, it's it's pretty common. You won't go a week. Yeah. You won't go a couple of days, I don't think, with, with Hells Angels activity common. not being reported on by the various newspaper outlets yeah, I mean, in California. Yeah, nightly broadcast. And so yeah. if you're from the Midwest... Um, you, you've probably heard of the Hells Angels because they're so iconic and famous, but, but you, you may not be aware of, um, uh, how active they are. And those are their superstar. Those are their superstar criminals. The way that the Joey Merlinos and the John yeah. Gotti's and On the, the East Coast, yeah. um, Joey Lombardo's from Chicago are, are the, uh, for the Midwest or the other parts of the East coast. Yeah. So this was, this was huge news, especially out West. Yeah. Th- this, this. And case that the New England guys connected. Yeah, to. and let's draw a line. Uh, I think that, that it's noteworthy that when the Rain Man, Chris Ranieri, the Rain Man, who is the boss of the Hells Angels, it seems like he's the boss of the entire state of Massachusetts, um, but I think officially he was the boss of the Boston, Boston slash Salem, Salem chapter. chapter. He's taken off the streets in either, I think it was 2017, it might have been 18, uh, and that coincides with this move that, that Richter, uh, I think, strategically looks at the Hells Angels losing their top, yeah. their top skipper in that region and pinpointing it as a, a place to expand to. Sure. Yeah. Now, let's talk about what brought Rayman Rainieri off the street. Um, so he was indicted in 2017, I believe, with... A, n- a number of Hell's Angels on th- on the West Coast, but most prominently, a guy that I want to make the 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 focus of the second half of this episode on is Ray Ray Folks, and maybe outside of California, Ray Ray Folks isn't a big deal, but in California, um, Ray Ray Folks is the modern day Sonny Barger, from what I hear. He is the most powerful, most respected, most feared. Uh, Hell's Angels shot caller, at, at least in the United States. Um, and he kind of took that reputation uh, from, the, from what used to be in that Barger crew. Uh, even though Barger's been out of California for a while, he's been, he yeah. was, in the end of his life, he was down in Arizona. Right. But uh, Northern California is traditionally a Hell's Angels yeah. like, stronghold. Right. So, uh, because Barger was from the Oakland right. area. So Ray Ray folks, um, I'm just kind of learning about him and talking to some people and, and doing my due diligence. Uh, but just what's on paper is, is pretty scary. I mean, the guy is, is a, is a real um, hurricane of, of uh, criminal activity and uh, seems to be a real, you know, cowboy. In, in, in a lot of his behavior and, and what he was convicted of last week, a uh, rain man was convicted of a murder. And we're going to get into that in a second. And that murder actually ties back to a hell's angels, um, uh, a rally motorcycle rally in, in new England. But the Ray Ray folks part of this case was tied to and Ray Ray's done a lot of prison time in the last 15 years. And I think he's got a, probably another four or five years left, but he'll be in his, uh, I think, mid sixties when he gets out, in, in early early sixties, maybe mid sixties, and he'll have some time, uh, you know, at the top of the heap. So he was in jail for something. He was the leader, and, and let's also be clear that the Ray Ray folks comes from, or was the, that is the head, or was the head of the Sonoma Valley uh, Hell's Angels chapter up in Wine Country. And he was serving time in the early 2010s and got out, found out that when he was in prison, one of his lieutenants was sleeping with his wife. They take that lieutenant. They beat him near death. Ray Ray folks leaves the beating, summons this guy's wife to the clubhouse in Sonoma Valley, sexually assaults his wife. After sexually assaulting his wife, returns to where this lieutenant is, uh, beaten and bloodied, and they jump on top of him, hold him down, and tattoo his face. Uh, It was just a a vicious retaliation and, and 
a, a vengeance plot with minus killing this guy uh, it, to, to assert his authority, uh, Ray Ray folks. And I believe very shortly after that, he was uh, picked up on that assault, which was then rolled into the racketeering case that uh, went on trial uh, this past couple months. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, just to be clear, I don't think folks was convicted of sexual assault. It's, I think it's alleged that's part of the, okay. but I don't, I don't think he was convicted of that. The allegation right. is that he sexually assaulted his victims. Wife. Right. Right. Um, but I, I don't, I don't, I can't say that he was convicted of that just to be, just to be yeah. fair here. Um, but he was convicted of some of these other things. Um, racketeering assault. Um, so yeah, let's, let's un- unpack this a little bit. Um, oh, does it have an age frame in there? Uh, no. It doesn't. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna look it up because part of part of the um, well, as you point out, this is an invest. This this stems from an investigation, uh, um, an event investigation that went on for three years. That was one of these joint task force investigations, feds, state, local, um, of so the Sonoma he's County. He's Fifty seven. Ray, oh, Ray, yeah. Ray folks is 57 right now. So this will be a young dude. I mean, at least he'll enough. probably have about, it will be a 10 year sentence for this, but he's already done five waiting yeah. for trial. He'll be out by the time he's 61, 62. So this was a joint investigation of the Sonoma County chapter. And uh, there were charges for murder, assault, home invasion, extortion, witness tampering, 11 indictments. Um, but it also includes a murder conspiracy. Right. Which dates Back to 2014, I believe. Which involves Rain, Rain Man. Man out That's in, the connection yeah, between East out and West in, Coast. Out in New England. So there was a, a rally in New Hampshire where all of the Hells Angels uh, from the West Coast traveled East. And Ray Ray folks, <laughs> living up to the reputation as, as this you know, cowboy gangster biker, um, has a sergeant at arms of his Sonoma Valley chapter named Joel Silva, who went by the nickname Doughboy. And they called themselves the Fuck Around and Find Out crew. Um, and, or F-A-F-O. Uh, and they were like a elite enforcement unit that the national bosses would send throughout California to, to regulate internally, and, and internal house cleaning. Yeah. Yeah. Not other right. clubs, but like guys, I mean, I think other from, clubs too, but yeah, but yeah, just to keep everybody in line. And, uh, I think there was another uh, group within that chapter that called themselves the young guns that were a group of younger, uh, initiates and so forth. So this was a real, heavy group uh, out of the Sonoma Valley uh, guys that were quick tempered um, quick triggered and uh, you know, at least amongst their club or in the biker world, this was their calling card. They were tough guys and, and they were uh, you know, relentlessly brutal. So Doughboy begins to get a reputation in the, in the 2010s in addition to being the head of this crazy unit under uh, Ray Ray, it becomes a, a drug addict, or maybe he was a drug addict before, but the, the, the drug habit that he was dealing with began to get increasingly worse, and it was causing rogue behavior. Mm-hmm. And when they were in New, New England, when they were in New Hampshire in the summer of 2014, for this rally, you had all the West Coast guys and all the East Coast guys there. And I guess Doughboy threatened Rain Man Rainieri's right-hand man. Mm-hmm. His, his, I don't know who that is, mm-hmm. um, but what was his best friend and, uh, you know, top lieutenant. Yeah. And at, according to testimony... And, and court records, that very afternoon or, or evening that that happened, 
a contract was placed on Doughboy Silva's head. Uh, the California bosses and Rainieri, I guess, la- wherever, the, wherever the altercation occurred, they removed themselves from that, went and held a impromptu meeting between Rainieri and uh, I believe the boss of the Fresno Hells Angels chapter. Mm-hmm. And they decided that they were going to go back to California, get Ray Ray folks to sign off, and which we don't know if he did or not. He's not um, I- implicated in, in the murder. But uh, they allegedly put the contract on his head out there and they planned it for a week or two. And then uh, Silva was, was lured to the Fresno Hells Angels chapter uh, under the pretense of a, of a marijuana deal. A deal that, that, ha- that I think the guy said he needed Doughboy as muscle, that he was afraid that the other Hells Angel was going to be confrontational. But it was it was just a ploy to get him there. They shot him in the head, and then cremated him at a a, a crematorium in a funeral home. Yeah. So allegedly, right? So yeah. I mean, that's one one thing I want to ask you about. And I we I texted you earlier about this, you know, privately about your legal analysis. Uh, among your many uh, hats you wear, you also have a law degree. Um, so I'm interested in your legal analysis here. So as, as you point out, right, he's lured to the clubhouse. According to this, uh, one of the guys who was convicted shoots Silva in the back of the head, and they take his body to a nearby funeral home, and the cremation oven with another body that was, that was there legitimately. Uh, then they set the, the car on fire. Um, so, so these guys, two of these guys were convicted last, last year of this, right. Of this murder conspiracy. And, and the one thing that stands out to me as I'm reading this is how do you get convicted of a murder conspiracy when there's no body? If the body is cremated, allegedly, <laughs> how do you like no body? I, I don't understand how these it's guys rare, get it's indi- rare. indicted on a, on a murder case when there's no, when there's no, when there's no body. It's rare. But it happens. Um, I, 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 there have been a number of high-profile cases. The one that I can think of immediately, and I texted this to you today, was the Billionaire Boys Club case, which was made into a television movie in the 80s with uh, Judd Nelson. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I actually yeah. love it. It's a great yeah, TV yeah, movie. Yeah. Um, the murder that put him away for life, uh, they never found the body. And to this day, Joe Hunt, who Judd Nelson played in that movie, who I think is in his 60s now, uh, insists that the guy's name was Ron Levin, insists that Ron Levin is living, you know, on a tropical island somewhere, drinking a pina colada, laughing that I'm in, this is Joe Hunt saying it, laughing that I'm in prison and that it was all a ploy to get him locked up. Uh, I think in both that case and in this case, you can get around it if you're a prosecutor and still get a guilty verdict. If you put people on the stand that claim that they participated in this yeah, and are saying firsthand, I did this either with the person at the defense table or at the behest of the person at the defense table. Yeah. And you're, you're believing the firsthand account on the witness stand more so than the, than a physical evidence of anybody. But it seems like it'd be very difficult to well, make that. Yeah, that, I claim. mean, that's what happened here because they have some. They had some high-profile snitches here who, who testified that they were that they participated in this murder. But if I'm a, I mean, I, I I wasn't on this. You know, I didn't sit on the jury, obviously. But if if I'm on the jury, and and you've got the relying on the testimony of presumably someone who's probably a sketchy dude mm-hmm. in their own right. And and there's no forensic evidence. I, I know you obviously you can be convicted without forensic evidence. That's been sort of this myth of like the uh, the CSI effect, right? Like now everyone thinks like, oh, if there's no forensic evidence, yeah. you don't get convicted. That's a myth. People right. get convicted all the time without forensic. I get it, but a murder? Like I mean that that's um, I mean uh, um, wasn't. Um, well, I, whatever. I don't want it to It seems like that would but, give but, you a leg up as a defense attorney. That's what I'm trying to say. They're trying to take my client and pin a murder on him. We don't even know if there was a murder. That's precisely. That, right. That's what, precisely. if I'm the defense attorney, that's what I'm saying. Right. Precisely. Like, this guy, for all we know, this guy took off and is living with his girlfriend in Switzerland. Right. right. 
Yeah. So I'm. I, I find it really interesting. Go find. Go convictions find him, here. or go find his body, or let my client go home because yeah. there is no. If there's no body, there's no murder. That's what I. That's what I would say, and I. I presume that these defendants will appeal this. I mean, I certainly would. It, well, two things that pop up in my head when we're talking about if we're going to tie this to the Cosa Nostra. Uh, first is Jimmy Hoffa. There's yes. no, there's no body. Yes. So I don't think they're ever going to bring charges, but if they ever were going to bring charges, they would have had to bring charges with nobody. Right. Um, and then, you know, more recently out of new England, Cadillac, Frank Salemi had, I don't want to say had skated on a murder. There was never any murder charges brought on the death of Stevie DeSaro because there was no body. Right. The body had vanished for, for 25 years um, and was unearthed via a tip from a guy that got jammed up in a, a drug case, didn't want to go to prison and said, Oh, by the way, 30 years ago, I, I helped the 25 years ago. I helped dispose of a body in my backyard of my uh, business. And they dug it up. And then all of a sudden Salemi who didn't have to worry about, that mm-hmm. case because there wasn't a body right. all of a sudden has to worry about it. Cause there's a body. Yeah. yeah. But to your point, the prosecutors in Massachusetts or I, I, I don't know. I don't remember if the case came out of Massachusetts or it came out of uh, Providence. They found the body in Providence, but the murder took place in Massachusetts. I'm pretty sure the, the case was out of Boston, yeah. but the prosecutors in Boston were not going to charge anybody right. with Stevie DeZaro's murder without a body, without, even though right. they had been told from pretty early on by Weddy Bulger's partner, Stevie Flemmy, who flipped, that Flemmy was present when the murder took place. Yeah. So, so they knew back in the 90s that Salemi was involved in it. Yeah. So even if you're pretty confident based on your sources, even if you're pretty confident that that's what happened without a body, it's yeah. tough to make. Uh, but isn't that, but that's all, isn't that always the, um, if you're a mob boss and you want to, uh, or if you're a mob boss, if you're any criminal that murders somebody and you want to get rid of the body, right? It's because the idea is no body, no crime, right? Reasonable doubt. Yeah. Right. I mean, so I, I'm, th- that was really striking to me and, and, um, and no body, no physical evidence. Yeah. And, and I know like, uh, you know, a lot of people might think, well, let, let's just talk about the, the, the crimes and it's, you know, it's kind of fascinating, but this legal part of it, I think is interesting. And I, I think our audience appreciates that. Uh, we do like to talk about criminal justice policy and sometimes we like to get in the weeds about the legal things here, but I, I think it's relevant. I mean, well, that and, was really and, striking and, and, to me and, that they and, could get a conviction on this. And when we're talking about, you know, legal order of operations or proper protocol, you know, folks as attorney was saying my client, it's very rare to be locked up for five years before you see the jury. Yes. It's normal that you, to be locked up for a year and a half, two, sure. two years. Sure. Three years is kind of, but once you hit five years, yeah. that's a little extensive. The, the good thing for him is that he's done five years of a 10-year bid. Right, which will count, right. Right, yeah. so he probably only has four years left to do. Um, and, if, and if you're in it from a, you know, a, a, war, a tactical war point of view, if you're Conan the Barbarian Richter and you're thinking, I mean, that's where his mindset is. You, know, you haven't eliminated Ray Ray Folk. It's not like Ray Ray Folks is going to have to be a, um, a, a incarcerated shot caller. Right. Maybe he'll, for a couple of years. He'll be on the street. But he'll be on the street by the end of this decade. Yeah, formidable. Yeah, Conan's uh, relatively, rival. Yeah, Conan's relatively young too. Uh, I think Conan's 62 or 63. Yeah. Um, so with Conan, Ray Ray folks, and then uh, Tommy O, who's the, the, the national or international boss of the outlaws out in Buffalo, you got three shot callers of the three or three of the premier motorcycle club brands in this country with, you know, uh, very robust uh and and energized leaders the, yeah. the leadership uh, doesn't seem to be going anywhere no i mean and it, it is interesting one thing else I'll, I'll point out as we wrap up it it is you know pretty dramatic examples here assault um allegedly this Just murder way- conspiracy but notice in, in, in the, you know they beat up the guys at the pagans clubhouse but um 
I understand that all that's illegal, but they didn't get anybody on any organized crime stuff here. Right, and, no- and even what they got Ranieri on, it's a murder conspiracy. It's right. not the murder itself, and he's only going to get 10 years for it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I look at it, if I was involved in a murder and I only got 10 years for that murder, I, that's a win for me. Yeah, yeah, it, because I, I, I think the sentencing hasn't been set yet. No, but the, I, I read the sentencing recommendations, oh, okay, and the recommendations okay. are it would be 10 years Yeah. Okay. for, yeah. Bo- for both of them. Yeah, for Ray Ray and uh, um, but there's there was nothing in it. Even Rain though it's Man. dramatic, it's worth reporting. It's worth talking about, and and I think it's fascinating. Well, but they didn't get anyone on any narcotics yeah. gambling. Um, and t- I should say that Tommy O, the Outlaws boss, isn't facing any cases right now. Yeah, he's in his uh, I think early fifties. Um, who knows how all of the Buffalo La Cosa Nostra investigations could eventually yeah. blow back on him because of his, There's some he, has, spillover. he has very close ties to the Magadino crime family. He's the head of security at the strip club that the, the Godfather's uh, nephew owns. And that nephew is going on trial this summer for uh, drugs and racketeering and prostitution. Yeah, we need to do it just based a, on in that club, a Buffalo. Episode. Or sorry, we, we get a lot of requests to do a Buffalo episode. Yeah, we, we should that. Based in that strip club, the, it's called Pharaohs. Right. Um, so, like I said, you got three bosses that are, uh, you know, in terms of shot calling age, are kind of in the prime of their careers. In that world, yeah, that's pretty young in, in that world. I mean, a lot of other professions, maybe not, yeah. but in that world, uh, leadership usually are senior, you know, guys, guys around that age. So, two more quick tidbits um, of some nuggets that I would, I'll pass along that I've, I've gotten fed to me. And, you know, take it with a, any amount of salt that you want. I haven't fully vetted these two things. Uh, first, I've been told that I don't know if Ray Ray folks, I don't know what his take on this potential merger or ceasefire or truce, truce yeah. with the outlaws is. It I, wouldn't be a merger. I know that. Right. It wouldn't be a merger <laughs> is the wrong word. Right. Uh, I don't know what his opinion is. I'm going to, I'm going to try to find that out. Mm hmm. Um, what I've been told, though, is that these conversations have been taking place um, in the Midwest, that, that there are um, Michigan, right? Some of them took place. I've here. heard they I've heard they're taking place like in Indianapolis. Oh. Um, but there was an issue in Michigan that got kind of nipped in the bud by these conversations yeah, where okay. there were I knew there was some kind there of were reports. Connection. Uh, last year in an indictment that uh, informants were talking about a war between the Hells Angels chapters that had just came into Michigan the last couple of years and the outlaws. But I was told that whatever conversations are being held has put that dispute on hold. Yeah. And uh, that there, that Indianapolis, this is what I was told that Indianapolis is the only major city where Outlaws and Hell's Angels operate like within a couple mile radius of each other, and they might not be friends. They co, but they're not well. trying to kill each other. Yeah, and that they're using that relationship, I guess. Um, and Hell's Angels just came into Indianapolis, I think, in the last ten years, mm. um, as a kind of a jumping off point for if they're going to be able to join forces to combat the the blue wave. So that's that's one little piece of evidence uh, or one piece of information that I've gotten, which I found interesting. Sure. Um, peace sum, biker peace summits in, in Hoosier land. Yeah. Maybe they go play basketball after 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 a hard, hard afternoon's work of trying to carve out a peace deal. They go shoot hoops or they <laughs> yeah. jump on the uh, They'd probably go ride. Right. Or, or they jump on the Indianapolis Speedway with their uh, Harleys and start start driving around. Yeah, I mean, uh, it'd be interesting to see. Uh, hopefully, they can, uh, you know, for for the sake of everyone, uh, coexist and uh, keep violence to a minimum <laughs> uh, for everyone. Sometimes sake. you I mean not to sound too Trumpy, but uh, some sometimes you got to show strength and um, as a means to to create peace, <laughs> at least in in these worlds. Yeah, 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 in that world. But we, I, it's interesting. I we do get feedback from some people in this world who. Um, who do their sentiment is that the different clubs should try to get along with each other 
because they have more in common than, yeah. than they don't. And that the real enemy is the FBI, the yeah. ATF, the DEA. But, you, but, but uh, if we're talking about outlaws and Hells Angels, I mean, you're talking about bad blood that sure. goes back a half century. Yep. I mean, the Long war time. erupted, I think, in 73 or 74 uh, related to some murders down in, Cal- uh, down in Florida from a dispute at a New Year's Eve party in uh, New York. And they were Massachusetts Hells Angels that were at this New, New, New York Hells, New York uh, New Year's Eve party, got into it with outlaws. These, four, these three Massachusetts Hells Angels beat the outlaws down. And then the outlaws invited these guys down to Florida, feigning, wanting a peace agreement, and yeah. killed them like in, a, in like a triple slain. And that erupted this war that's been going on for it, it is interesting the the politics of it because we know there are clear examples where there are times where these guys do coexist with each other and 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 I've heard from guys who say I, I don't have a problem yeah. with with a dude from another club and um but obviously things get complicated sometimes and, and we and we know from our interview with George Christie yeah as well as uh, the former Hell's Angels boss uh, as well as this was documented in, in, in court filings that in the nineties, there were peace talks Sure, oh yeah, with George Christie and Taco Bowman. Yeah. And high of course level talks, yeah. high, to, to quash squash the beef um, between the two clubs. And according to George, it was all derailed by this guy, Spike O'Donnell, who was the boss of Milwaukee or one of the bosses of Milwaukee, who there was always a lot of bad blood in Milwaukee between hell's angels and, and, and outlaws. And uh, well, Harley Davidson is yeah from Milwaukee, sure. and uh, that he he that he he put a wrench into it. That mm-hmm. O'Donnell made it so Christie couldn't make the peace. Right. So That's it's right. not unprecedented that there there are, there are talks. Uh, and then the, the I'll, I'll end with Conan Richter. Conan the Barbarian Richter uh, is supposed to come out in August. Officially, he's not the boss anymore. He gave up the boss title to uh, a guy from Virginia, Big Bob Francis. And uh, Big Bob is a, an OG, a, a guy I've heard, a guy that everybody loves, um, is, is known as, a, uh, you know, salt of the earth, um, gets along with a lot of different factions and doesn't have ambitions of anything more than being a, a, a seat warmer. Mm-hmm. Um, and that I, I had heard that it was possible Francis was going to get removed before Richter comes home. But Francis has been in, according to uh, some, some affidavits that were signed by DE agents a couple of years ago, Francis has, had taken over for Richter when Richter went to jail in 21. Um, and the common belief is that either Francis has already stepped aside or when Conan the Barbarian comes out of lockup in August, will step aside and Conan will then become the boss again. So officially Conan, even though I've been calling him the boss, I've been calling him the president, officially he has not been for the last two years when he's been in federal uh, detainment. But it sounds like it'll be a peaceful transition. Yeah, it, I don't think Bob Francis, I think that, that was the reason they put Bob Francis in mm-hmm. there. They're like, you've done... Great things for us in the last 30, 40 years. You got a ton of respect. We want to give you the title for a couple of years so you can say you were the, bo- the national boss. Um, but really, it's not, a, it's not a long-term thing. You're just here to kind of make that, sure everything's steady when Conan goes That away. happened with, uh, and now we're geeking out, but yeah. that happened with Preziola in Detroit with the in-between Zerilli and yeah. Jack Toko. Right. It was they a similar him, they parallel gave thing. Him, right. Well, like, you'll, you'll have the title for a couple of years. Yeah. Because Priscilla was an OG, yeah. well, internationally well, and respected. to really geek out, it can <laughs> it can go wrong. I mean, Jimmy Hoffa, he thinks oh, yeah. he's putting Frank yeah. Fitzsimmons, yeah, that back his right hand <laughs> in as a seat warmer, right? And Fitzsimmons was like, I kind of like this seat, yeah, yeah, and I have ambitions, and I I, I want to be the boss. And yeah, you had your time in the sun, yeah. Uh, so I don't think that's w- w- what we have here, and I think Richter will come back, and, and there'll be a seamless transition. The question becomes. Does Richter take it into even a higher gear oh, for now the that wave, he, the blue for wave. the wave now that he's out because there's been a lot of activity when he was when he was in lockup. I, I mean, the, the, 
the fact that there's a chapter in Montana right now, it really blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah, that's really <laughs> far west. Yeah. So uh, it, we'll see and we'll, we'll keep, we'll monitor it and uh, we'll keep giving you the information on the biker politics because there's quite a bit of uh, outlaw biker politics that that's permeating or yeah. percolating in the United that's States. It's really right interesting, a, a fascinating uh, subculture. Yeah. And so we, we thank everyone for listening and, and for watching. Uh, again, please subscribe, follow us on social media. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Scott Bernstein. We're out. <laughs>